I'm in Calgary, Alberta at the homestead of Verge Permaculture or Rob Avis. Many of you guys might know Rob. I've done a few videos with him. We've been friends for 10 years and I'm here at his Passa Solar Greenhouse and this is a real uh, urban permaculture homestead here and uh, this video we're going to talk about his Passa Solar Greenhouse. It's a really neat design. It's really compact and it's not what you would typically see in a neighborhood such as this but it's it works for them and it allows them to have food fresh food year round they also put their rabbits in here over the winter and in this video rob is going to talk about kind of the mistakes that he made and what he would do differently going forward Hey folks, my name is Rob Avis and I run Verge Permaculture here in Calgary, Alberta. And today we're standing in front of my passive solar greenhouse. And I really like this greenhouse because it's a great teaching opportunity for folks. And before we get into passive solar greenhouse design, let me just tell you a little bit about my background. So I'm a mechanical engineer. I started off in the oil and gas industry. And uh, after working there for quite a while, I kind of got a little bit tired of the status quo. And so we actually quit our jobs and traveled around the world learning about renewable energy because we were energy engineers. And on our way, we learned about um, the fact that energy, replacing energy in the world is actually pretty easy to do. Um, there's actually more than enough sun and wind to repower the world. But we started to get really concerned about where our food came from. And given that Calgary's context is such a harsh growing condition, one of the first things that we had to figure out when we came back from our travels was how to grow in 100 frost free days in the worst hail belt in the world um, and ensure that we actually got a crop every year because almost every year we get uh, anywhere from quarter inch to one inch hail balls landing on our garden and it's a total pain in the butt. So this was my first um, run at passive solar greenhouses and at the time I was working for a passive solar home company and so I used a lot of the ideas from passive solar home design in this greenhouse which is actually why it um, was a bit of a disaster and ironically even though there's a bunch of mistakes I've made on this greenhouse it still works quite well and so I thought in this video we could actually talk about some of my mistakes because a lot of people talk about their successes but uh, mistakes tend to be a better learning opportunity than successes. So this greenhouse, and you've probably seen a lot of these on the internet, has a 70 degree slope on the front. In the 1970s and 80s, uh, there was a big movement towards passive solar greenhouse design. And at the time, the technology in glazing was not where it is right now. And so a lot of these structures used glass as a glazing medium as opposed to polycarbonate, which is what this is right here. And the thing with glass is that um, you need to orient the glass to get optimal transmissivity of the light perpendicular to the sun angle in the months that you choose to grow in. And because these were winter greenhouses, they wanted steep angles in these northern climates in order to ensure that the maximum amount of sun would actually come through the glazing. So not knowing a lot about the properties of Lexan or polycarbonate at the time, I copied that idea out of these greenhouse books and we ended up with this 70 degree angle. And so the neat thing with polycarbonate now is that when light hits the glass or the glazing, it actually splits up and the plants actually prefer to grow underneath polycarbonate over glass because it changes the properties of the light somehow. And so one of the most important things that you can do when you're choosing a glazing material, likely to be polycarbonate, probably not glass, especially in a hail belt, is that you wanna make sure that it has a, at least a 70% transmissivity. Now the interesting thing with polycarbonate is that as the transmissivity goes down, the R value or resistance to heat loss goes up. And so we're constantly fighting this battle between energy efficiency and having enough light come through. And so what we've ended up doing or recommending for our, our next generation of greenhouses, which you've actually seen on Kurt's channel um, at Hall Services where, where Vaden is growing, 
um, is we're actually designing um, uh, thermal curtains because the glazing material is your best ally during the day and your worst liability at night. In other words, it lets in more energy through the day than it lets out, um, but at night it's the exact opposite. It lets out more energy than it lets in. And so the easiest way to manage the transmissivity R paradox is to put a very simple to pull across thermal curtain made out of a construction tarp or something like that. So uh, after all of that, the next version of these greenhouses actually has a much shallower slope and the slope of the greenhouse is dictated more by your snow load and ultimately the size of truss and building materials that you have available in your bioregion than it is by light because this material is just so superior to glass. <coughs> the other mistake that I made was I put um, basically an eave on the top and while the eave actually serves some really good functions in terms of managing uh, drip lines and things like that and so we actually have a more robust structure that way the intent for that eave was to cancel out some of the sun because one of the problems that greenhouses have is they overheat unfortunately there's nothing you can do well there's very little you can do about the overheating piece because the plants need light and so as a passive house engineer this makes tons of sense because we can just block out the sunlight but designing greenhouses we don't want to block the sunlight out we just want to increase the amount of ventilation to manage the overheating as opposed to trying to block the sun because your plants stop photosynthesizing so little things like that were not super obvious to me when i first started designing as a result of this steep slope we also ended up putting our vent wall really low down to the ground and so you can imagine how much snow builds up here in this northern climate which means that the opportunity to actually allow air in, in the winter just is not feasible um, so in our future or next revision of our greenhouses this ends up being a solid knee wall to accumulate for snow and then our vent wall comes up here and so as a result of a shallower slope a knee wall and a tall vent wall now you don't hit your head all the time as a six foot guy uh, when I'm harvesting in here, I'm constantly banging my head against this stupid front wall and it, it drives me absolutely nuts. Um, and so the whole kind of shape and ergonomics of the greenhouse change because of this little bit of technology right here, which is pretty cool. So uh, maybe we'll go inside and take a peek and we'll talk a little bit about venting as well as um, some of the mistakes we made with the foundation, um, rocket mass heaters and how we're kind of using this greenhouse in a slightly different way to accommodate for the design mistakes that we've made. Given that this greenhouse is built on top of a concrete foundation or um, driveway basically, we ended up having to build an insulated floor here, which means that our plants don't have access to subsoils and soils. And so as a result of all the overheating that occurs naturally in passive solar greenhouses, you end up with plants that are pretty diseased or they get diseased very easily because of the lack of ventilation and the lack of good access to the um, high cation exchange capacity of subsoils. So because of our limitation here, we ended up growing in wicking beds and I highly recommend that people do not do this. Um, wicking beds have this really kind of sexy appeal for folks, but, uh, and ironically, it's the most read blog on my website, um, <clears throat> which is kind of to my chagrin. Uh, it's, I'm known as the wicking bed guy, unfortunately, but um, uh, it's a really great blog if you want to learn how to build them, but I would not recommend them to grow in greenhouses. So uh, ideally your greenhouse should be planted into the ground so that your plants can actually get access to real soil and that you're not trying to grow above grade. Um, you'll notice just really quickly we've got powered vents on the end. Those are not big enough. Um, and then we've got ventilation at the top of the greenhouse which gives us a really nice chimney effect and those make a really big difference. Lastly, I want to just talk about the um, heating systems. And so this is our rocket mass heater. We do use this in the winter time. However, this is really a big zoning issue. This, this heater has to be fed every 15 minutes, which is a total pain in the butt at minus 30 outside. Um, having to come out into the greenhouse and feed this all day long every 15 minutes is just not, it's a, it's a poor design essentially. Um, <clears throat> and so I don't actually recommend rockets unless you're going to be spending a lot of time just kind of hanging out and reading books in here which is ironically what we've kind of converted the space to in the winter time. We hang a hammock in the back there um, and then we set up our rabbit system in here, which is where we grow, uh, grow out our, our kind of adult rabbits through the winter time. 
So I think rockets are great, but for a production greenhouse, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, if you're gonna be into production greenhouse growing, just put in an automatic heater and set the thermostat to whatever temperature it is that you're going to uh, grow at. So hopefully you found that interesting. Um, those are kind of the kind of key mistakes that I've made and as a result of that, it's ended up informing the Passive Solar Greenhouse course that Kurt and I teach together. Um, we've kind of taken all the learnings from his greenhouse as well as from my greenhouse. And um, I, I know Kurt this year has done a whole bunch of renovations on his specific space and it's really improved the overall functionality just based on some of these ideas that we've talked about and all the conversations that Kurt and I have. Um, we're going to leave information for uh, in the show notes below regarding the Passive Solar Greenhouse course coming up here in October on Small Farm Academy and I know Kurt's going to close the video out with a couple of comments as well. So hopefully you found that interesting. If you want to get a ton more information on Passive Solar Greenhouse design, check out Small Farm Academy and you can also head over to the Verge Permaculture YouTube channel as well. I've got a bunch of videos there. If you guys liked that and you want to join up and learn about passive solar greenhouses, if you have any interest in making a passive solar greenhouse, I would highly recommend taking our course because it will save you so much money and time that the value of the course will pay for itself. The designs for a greenhouse like this, when I built mine, cost over a thousand dollars for just the designs so you're going to save that right on the course and you're going to end up with designs that you can use so it's worth every single penny if you're serious about building one of these things i highly recommend taking our courses you're going to save that money right out of the gate so those links will be in the show notes and i'll also link to rob's channel and some of his stuff if you want to check out more videos that he's done